Hey everybody, Merry Christmas, welcome. Good to see all of you. If you're our guest here at Brave, just checking things out. We're so glad that you're here. I'm Darren Laws. I'm one of the pastors around here. And uh, people have been talking about how I always wear the black, same black long sleeve shirt. So I added buttons. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We're in uh, part two of a holiday teaching series called Peace on Earth. The Smithsonian calls this period that we're living in the age of anxiety. We're all searching for peace. Isn't that true? We want peace on earth. We just want it in different ways. We search for peace on vacation. We think, man, if I could just go to Bora Bora and I could find me some peace. You know what I mean? Those uh, bungalows that are over the water and the clear ocean and the white sand and a pina colada, and I could find me some peace. Amen? If I could just afford to get away somewhere, just go somewhere, I could escape all of my stress and everything would be okay. Some are searching for peace in relationships. Man, the wedding was great. The pictures were great. The honeymoon was great. But now we have children. And it's a 24-hour job. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they bring you a lot of happiness and joy and the cute little Christmas family pics and the first day of school, but they give you no peace, right? I mean, some of us are searching for peace and money, but money doesn't give you peace. It just magnifies all of your other insecurities before you had money. If you're a worrier with no money, you're a worrier with money. Our culture is full of people trying to find peace without God. And that's kind of the insanity of it all. I want peace without the one who gives peace. And so we look for peace in so many places. But the problem is none of those places can deliver. You can't get peace from a drink. You can't get lasting peace from a vacation. You can't get peace from just filling your schedule with holiday activities and parties. You can't get it from finding the perfect husband. Just, just ask my wife, right? Sometimes we can't get peace from just even like grand gestures. I mean, like, like getting a puppy, like a golden retriever puppy with a red bow. I mean, that's such a classic Christmas mistake. You know what I'm saying? I mean, the first night you spend with that little puppy, they just cry all night long. And, and then comes the big first big mess all over the floor. And then your puppy finds the garbage can and, and you wonder, what have I done? I mean, I've got to keep it now, you know? Um, real life is never as good as the movie you just saw. Have you noticed in the movies, like I've, I've watched this, like, Whenever there's a, a breakup, there's so much more mature in a movie when they break up. Like, it's me. No, it's me. We're, we just want different things. And then they hug. And the other guy or gal that they're interested in sees them hug, and now it's all messed up, and it takes them a whole movie to figure it out. But their homes are nicer in the movies. Like, I look at their homes, and I go, how do they afford that? You know, like, I mean, that, how, do, how, do they, how do they get that nice home? And, and then the parents, like, they always have, like, a ranch in Montana or a maple farm, right? Like, where can I find peace on earth? I, I feel like... If Chick-fil-A was open on Sundays, like that would be a big start for me, right? I mean, how many times do I leave church on Sunday and I think, man, I'm just going to go get me a number one with waffle fries and a large iced tea. And, and then I realize Chick-fil-A isn't open because they don't work on Sundays. I work on Sundays, but they, they can't work on Sundays. I don't know what the deal is. I just want a little comfort, like some chicken strips, you know, and everything would be fine. We're searching for peace and we're trying to find peace in a holiday sugar cookie. I, lately, I've been watching all these movies and they all make sugar cookies. Like grandma or whoever it is always goes into the kitchen and they're making sugar cookies. And then I, I had one the other day and I forgot, oh my gosh, what a sugar low after that was over with, right? We try to find peace in fitness and let's go on a cruise or financial security or our home, a relationship or through snow in the bay at Brave Church. I mean, that's coming up. That's going to be a, a big high for most of of us. It all provides some level of comfort, you know, some good feelings, some happy thoughts, but no lasting peace for two reasons. One is 
our view of peace is completely confused. We don't have clarity on what peace actually is. And two, we have this relentless enemy that comes to steal our peace called worry. And worry comes in all different forms, anxiety, fear, stress. The good news is that Jesus Christ came to give us peace on earth. The word of God says in Luke 2, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. That sounds so inviting to me. Jesus Christ in scripture is called the Prince of Peace. And that means that he's actually the source of peace. I bet you haven't thought of peace that way before, that, that peace is not an experience. It's not a place you go to. It's not an event. It's not a place that peace is found in Jesus Christ, that peace is an inside job. There, there's a myth about worry, and the, and the myth is this, is that, is that I can control things by worrying about them. Somehow, if I worry about it enough, I can change what's going to happen. Uh, you know, if I worry about my children, well, then that'll somehow solve things. Or if I worry about my, my marriage or my job or the economy, I can somehow change the outcome. There are seven top stresses in life. Here they are. Number one is job, is a huge stress. Number two is money. Number three is health. Number four is relationships. Number five is diet. Number six is media overload. And number seven is a lack of sleep. And so the truth is, worry is powerless to change anything on that list of seven. Worry can only make us miserable. And I think we would all agree that, that worry and anxiety and fear and stress are all enemies of peace on earth. And so today's message title is, Worry Less, Enjoy More. You like that? I thought of that. Worry less, enjoy more. And so there is a way to experience peace on earth. Philippians 4, verse 7, it says, If you do these things, you'll experience God's peace, which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. The Bible calls this the peace that passes understanding. It bypasses the human mind. When you're in a situation and you have like no logical reason to be at peace, but you are, that's the peace that passes your understanding. Your human mind can't understand it. it, it it's something that happens like deep inside of you that has nothing to do with what's going on outside of you. When, when you're in a crisis uh, just in stress beyond anything that you've known before, and you have no idea why you have peace in that moment, that, that deep sense of calming peace inside of you, that's the peace that passes understanding. And so God says in, in Philippians 4, verse 7, he said, if you do these things, you'll experience God's peace, which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand, and then I love this part. His peace will keep your thoughts quiet and keep your heart at rest. The average person has seven different fears. And rarely are we self-aware enough to know what those seven different fears are. But God has given us over 7,000 promises in the Bible. So the way I look at it, on average, God has given us 1,000 promises per fear, right? That's pretty amazing. And God says, if, if you do these things that I'm about to tell you, he says, his peace will keep your thoughts quiet and put your heart at rest. A mind at rest causes your body and soul to be at rest. Now, there are four things that God specifically says to do in our passage. But first, for several years, I've been a, I've been a fellow struggler. I, I've known worry and I've known anxiety, and I've battled the unknowns of my future. I've battled the unknowns of my family. And there are some things that I simply do not have the answers for. I'm a fixer, and I can't begin to tell you how hard it is to watch the love of my life struggle in life every single day. You don't have to know all the details to trust me. There's just a lot to it. And so every night, Tracy and I pray a prayer that goes something like this, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy. Just have mercy, Lord. 
You see, the challenges we face, they're just too big for us. They're too demanding for us. They're too stressful for us. And they're beyond our capacities to cope. You don't need to know everything that's going on to understand. And I don't need to know everything that's going on in your life to understand that you're going through some things and you're going, you know what? This is too much for me. So what I'm about to teach on is not a theory. It's a life message that I'm living through and I'm living through it with you. And so if you call worry, I'm, you know, I'm just concerned. I get you. If you call fears and you say, well, I, I, there's just uncertainty, I get you. If you say, instead of anxiety, I feel stress, I get you. If your greatest fear is that you're, you have no answers for this, that's a lie. Because the first step to peace, and you can write this down, the first step to peace, number one, is refuse to worry. Refuse. Worry is a choice. Take away worry's power. Expose worry for what it is. Take worry out back and beat the crap out of it like the 49ers did to the Cowboys and the Eagles. You know what I'm saying? Do I hear an amen? Amen. amen. God says in Philippians 4 verse 6, never worry about anything. Never worry about anything anything. It's not a suggestion. God says, never worry about anything. Yeah, but do you, yeah, I, don't, I don't read any buts in this verse. There's buts everywhere, right? But there's no buts in this verse. If there's, you know, what, what about my story though? What about my circumstance? What about the challenge that I'm facing? Have you ever like taken that to God and God goes, oh my, I don't know what to do with this. I, I understand what you're saying. I, Go ahead, worry. No, God says, never worry about anything. It, it, it's a command, not an option. You know, I don't, I don't get it. You're raised in church and everybody's worried about all these big three sins or whatever. And we never talk about the sin of worry, of just not trusting, of not obeying the command. Don't worry. And so the answer to not worrying is really simple. Are you ready for this? Stop it. But Pastor Darren, I've spent my whole life worrying. Do you expect me to just stop it? Yes. But, but I, I, I have trouble with worry. I, I, I just can't help myself. Well, do you steal cars at night? No. That, that's a rhetorical question. You can answer it, right? Do you murder? No, I hope not. Are you a Raider fan? Stop it. Just stop. Why would you do that? You only have one life. Why would you do that? The English root word for worry means to choke. If you're choking yourself, do you think you could stop? Well, yeah, of course. Well, why would we want to choke the life right out of our life? Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 25, he says, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink or about your body or what you'll wear, which I don't worry about, right? I've got one shirt and I wear it all. Well, now I have buttons. But anyway, is not life more important than food? Is not the body more important than clothes? Write this down. Worry is unreasonable. Have you noticed if somebody says something bad about you that the more you think about it, the more the whole thing kind of grows in your mind and it just kind of like a treadmill that you can't get off. Someone said that at age 20, we're always, we're, you know, we worry about what others think about us. At age 40, we don't care what others think about us. And at age 60, we realize they were not thinking about us at all. So worry is unreasonable because it just exaggerates reality. Jesus says in Matthew 6, verse 26, he says, look at the birds of the air. They, they don't sow or reap or store away in barns. They have no savings account of any kind. Yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not more, much more valuable than they? Write this down. Worry is unnatural. Birds, they don't do anything. They just fly around and tweet and eat. And yet their heavenly father takes care of them. When I was a kid, uh, we had two parakeets that my parents got us and we called them Pete and repeat. 
Actually, I don't remember their names. But anyway, my brother and I were, all, were always more important to my parents than those two parakeets. And yet those parakeets in our house, they always had everything that they needed. In the entire universe, the only creations of God that worry are human beings. Birds don't worry. Cows don't worry. Dogs don't worry. I, I've never seen our dog worry about anything. We have this really cute little golden doodle. Her name is Grace, and she's absolutely adorable. And she's the smartest dog I've ever owned. And, and she's just a really good dog. But, but right now I'm mad at her because I do whatever she tells me to do. I obey my dog. I'm watching a game. She comes right over, sits right down in front of me, sits there staring at me, giving me the look. And that look means if you need to stop what you're doing right now and you need to go open the back slider for me. And if you don't, I'm going to do something that you're going to regret. So I stop. I I'm, I'm a, I do things on command. I get up. I do exactly what my dog wants me to do. When she wants dinner, she comes and sits, exact same spot, stares at me, gives me the look, and I obey. And I get up, and I go get her dinner. She's the only one in our house that eats at the exact same time every, every evening. I do whatever my dog tells me to do. My dog never worries about a single thing. Jesus said, look at the birds they don't do anything. They just fly around, tweet, and eat. And yet, Father God provides everything they need. Worry is unnatural. Birds don't worry. My dog isn't worrying. As human beings, are you not more important than animals? Of course you are. And our Heavenly Father says, never worry about anything. You were not born to worry. Babies do not worry at all. You have to learn how to worry. You're taught to worry as you get older. Worry is just unnatural. So stop it. Proverbs 12, 25, it says, worry weighs a person down. An encouraging word cheers a person up. Proverbs 14, verse 30, it says, a peaceful heart leads to a healthy body. That's an amazing verse. A peaceful heart leads to a healthy body. Write this down. Worry is unhealthy. It's just unhealthy. There's not one study that says that there's a healthy kind of worry. Like there are healthy kinds of stress, like an ice plunge. That's really in right now. Go ahead, do that. I just want to stay warm. But there's healthy kinds of stresses. An ice plunge is good for you, I hear. There are no healthy kinds of worry, like zero. When people say, I'm just, I, I'm worried sick, they are. The doctors say that a lot of people could leave the hospital if they could get rid of three things. Think about this, guilt, bitterness or unforgiveness, and worry. It's not just what you're eating, but what's eating at you. You want to be healthier? Stop worrying. Matthew 6, verse 30 if God cares so wonderfully for the flowers that are here today and gone tomorrow, won't he most surely care for you, O oh, you of little faith? Write this down. Worry is unnecessary. God says, what in the world are you worried about? Don't you know that I'm going to take care of you? Haven't I always taken care of you? I made you. I created you. I saved you. I love you. I put my spirit in you. Hey, like, 20 years ago, were your bills paid back then? Yeah, I think so. You're okay. Did you eat 20 years ago? Yeah, obviously. <laughs> right? It's going to be okay. God says, don't you know I'm going to take care of you? Haven't I always taken care of you? Yeah, but I've got a current fear right now I'm dealing with. I've got a current worry right now I'm dealing with. Yeah, but in the past, you made it this far, right? Dr. Walter... Coverts, his research on worry reveals this. 40% of our worries never happen. 30% of our worries concern the past. How silly is that, right? It's already gone. 12% of our worries are needless worries about health. 10% of our worries are insignificant and petty concerns. 8% of worries are really legitimate concerns. According to researchers by Penn State University, only about 
8% of the things that we worry about come true. In other words, less than one in 10 chances. And if you're a worrier, you're going, see, I told you there's, there's one chance. <laughs> it's less than one out of 10. Worry is a choice. Worry is a habit. Worry is like a rocking chair. It'll occupy you, but it will not get you anywhere. No one is forcing you to worry. It's, it's not some like uncontrollable experience that comes on you. Yes, it comes on you, but you can stop it. And the first step to peace, number one, is refuse to worry because worry is unreasonable. Worry is unnatural. It's unhealthy. It's unnecessary. First Peter 5, verse 7, it says, unload all your worries on God since he's looking after you. I like that. Unload all your worries on God. The scripture is telling you, unload all your worries on God. Did you know in the original Greek, that word unload means drop it? Drop your worries. Drop it. Stop it. Let it go. Here comes a worry. Drop it. Stop it. Let it go. God says, you know all these things that you're stressing about, all these things that you're worried about right now? Drop it. Stop it. Let it go. The second step to peace, number two, is tell God where it hurts. Believe it or not, many people pray all around their feelings instead of actually talking to God. It's amazing how much useless prayer goes on. Wow, did he just say that? Yes. When you're not being real in your conversation with God, it's not a real conversation. It's not real prayer. There are, listen to these two different types of prayers. One goes something like this. This is one of the most popular God, thank you. You've always given to us and you've always met our needs. Thank you. That's a great prayer unless your real prayer is this. God, I'm worried. I don't know if we're going to have enough this month. And to be honest, I don't know for sure if you're going to come through. And that's where I'm really at. That's a real prayer. The other one was not a real prayer. It was just like, that's what you're supposed to pray. But God knows what's in your heart. And he loves it when you get honest with him. And I find the more specific you are in your prayers, the better the answers. You see, you have to get real before your reality changes. How does God really help you when you're praying all these prayers that aren't really where you're really at or who you really are or what you're really dealing with? What's supposed to happen with that? But the moment I get real about my reality and my situation and where I'm at, there's an opportunity for breakthrough to happen in my life. Philippians 4, verse 6, it says, never worry about anything. Instead, in every situation, let God know what you need. Are you in a situation right now? Is something just really on your mind and heart right now? In every situation, let God know what you need in prayer and in your requests. If it's not worth praying about, it's not worth worrying about. You know, I've heard people talk about when they talk about trust and, and they talk about how that, like, I never worried about my parents having enough money or, you know, I could always go to my dad or my mom and they would get me whatever I needed. And I never worried about that. And, and I think that's great. I think that that's a great childhood if that was your childhood. But for some of us, that wasn't our reality. My, my childhood, my dad became severely disabled, lost all ability to create an income. My mom made $1,200 a month at an insurance agency. And we had plenty to worry about. When, we, when, when, when I came home, when we came home, there was just financial insecurity everywhere. My best friend and his father, they had a lot of money. They were very gracious to us. They were very generous to us. But when I went home, I knew that we lacked financial security. I knew that when we took one can of chili beans and watered it down and made it into four bowls, that we were trying to make things stretch. And so I worried about money from first grade to fifth grade. My reality was very raw. When they taught us at school about, you know, uh, fire home safety in elementary school, I, I worried about getting my dad out of the house if there was a fire. And, and, and they would tell me, they would say, well, if there's a fire in your house, just get you and your little brother out, but don't worry about your dad. Sure, 
I'm not that I didn't buy into that philosophy at all. It made me worried all the more. How am I going to get my disabled dad out of the house? I worried about protecting my family because I was aware as a child, we have no protection. And so looking back now, I've spent my whole life, like many of you, learning not to worry, learning to trust in Father God. And when God says, I'll take care of you, the default setting in my mind used to always ask, are you sure? Like, I know I'm supposed to trust right now and everything's going to work out, but are you sure? Faith is living like God tells the truth. That's a great statement. It's harder to live. And so I've had to learn how to do that. I've had to learn that God does tell the truth and God is faithful, that that there's no area of my life that God isn't interested in. If giving your trust to God is the issue, I want to encourage you to take your relationship with God to the next level. Find a spot, go for a drive, go to a park, go somewhere and begin having a real conversation today about where you're really at, about what's troubling you, about, hey, I do want to trust in you, but I don't know that I can trust in you. And these other things have happened, and I'm not sure about these things, and have a real conversation with him. And you'll be surprised what happens. Number one, refuse to worry. It's a choice. Two, tell God where it hurts. And number three, thank God for all he's done. Philippians 4, verse 6, when you ask God for what you need, also thank him for all he's done. You know, study after study has shown that the healthiest emotion known to human beings, do you want to know what it is? The healthiest emotion known to human beings is gratitude. The more you build gratitude in your life, the happier and healthier you are in life. Gratitude is like a lubricant in your brain that heals you and helps you perform well in life. Studies show that an attitude of gratitude actually strengthens your immune system while being ungrateful, resentful, entitled, jealous. It weakens your immune system. Gratitude is one of the cures of depression. And it's no wonder that God's remedy for worry is large doses of gratitude. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18, I love this verse. It says, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Number one, refuse to worry. Two, tell God where it hurts. Three, thank God for all that he's done. And lastly, number four, fill your mind with good thoughts. Fill your mind with good thoughts. Napoleon Hill said, thoughts are things. The apostle Paul said in Philippians four, verse eight, he said, fill your mind with those things that are true and good and right. Think about things that are pure and beautiful and respected. And if anything is excellent, if anything is worthy of honor, think about those things, fill your minds. You see the battle for peace isn't out there somewhere. It's inside your mind. The source of your stress is not your family. Stop saying that. The source of your stress is not your spouse. The source of your stress is not your children. The source of your stress is not your job. And it's not your dog. It's you, and it's how you view each one of them. It's you. It's how you think about your life. So practice. It takes practice. Practice filling your mind with good thoughts. Control what you allow into your mind and the stream of your conscience. Corey Tim Boom said this, if you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. But if you look at Christ, you'll be at rest. It all depends on who you have your eyes on and what you fill your mind with. You see, the key to all of my problems today is acceptance. I accept that I am not God. 
I accept that I don't have a solution. I accept that I cannot control my life. I accept my limitations. I accept that I'm good looking. In fact, why don't you say that out loud to the person next to you? I accept that I'm good looking. Go ahead. Say it to the person next to you. Some of you aren't doing it. Go ahead. I accept that I'm good looking. Didn't that feel good? There's just some things you need to accept. That's one of them. I accept that I'm good looking. The reason that many of us worry more and enjoy less is we've got a wrong definition of peace on earth. You see, we think peace is when nothing around me is going wrong. That's peace. The problem with that definition is you'll never have peace because there's always something going on that could be just a little bit better. There's always some little stress in the corner, some little worry or concern. Peace is not found in anything that's outside of you. There, there's no vacation. There's no magical relationship. There's no better marriage. There's no job. There's no perfect family. There's no amount of money. There's no level of fitness that will give you peace of mind. Peace is found with God on the inside of you. And the scripture says that you and I have been made a partaker of a divine nature. I want you to think about that. The challenge is being willing to partake. Someone stresses you out. What do you do? You call your spouse and stress them out, <laughs> right? First thing you do, it's what you do. That's what, what a spouse is for. I'm stressed. So I'm going to stress them out too, right? The kids are screaming in the kitchen, right? What do you do? Scream back. Of course, right? The idiot at work rubs you the wrong way. What do you do? You go out with a friend and you spent the entire lunch talking about the idiot at work. Who's the idiot now? You see, when we're experiencing a lack of peace, the last thing that we most often do is partake of the divine nature of Christ. We treat Christ like, like he's eating more vegetables, you know, like it's a last resort. I want to invite you to partake. Here's what I mean. In the moment of your pain, partake. In the moment of your stress, partake. In the moment of your worry, partake. In the moment of your anxiety, partake. Train yourself to partake of the divine nature. That's when God gives you a new perspective. Now, how do I do that? First, I become aware. I realize, wow, worry is just, these thoughts just, um, they're just coming at me right now. They're visiting my mind. And then I make a decision to choose not to worry. I call it out. This is worry. I name it. I don't just let it just go on in my head. I call it out. This is worry. This is worry that's coming against me right now. And then I tune into God. And I wait on God and I pray real prayers and I journal and I read and I listen to worship music and I go for a run. Okay. Maybe not a run. Got carried away. That was so not real. I do not run. I do a brisk walk. I'm in the blue zone. I think it's level two. I don't really know, but I pray. I pour my heart out to God. I have a real conversation and, and here's what happens. Every single time inside of me, the presence of God starts to like, just rise up. And my emotions start to give the nod to God. They start to submit. My emotions start to surrender to God. And I begin to settle down. I begin to calm down and I begin to realize Everything is going to be okay. Everything is going to be okay. Acceptance is the answer to all of my problems today. My situation hasn't changed, but I'm changing. There's a verse that says in Job 22, 
Obey God and be at peace with him. This is the way to happiness. True peace is found by making peace with God. And when you make peace with God, then you have the peace of God. And now you have the power to make peace with others. Real peace is when you're able to go back into your home today, when you're able to go back to work on Monday, when you're able to go back into a relationship, when you're able to go into your family on the holidays, and you have this sense of peace and calm deep in your soul because you now know everything is going to be okay. Everything. And so worry less and enjoy more. Amen? God bless you.